Hello and welcome to another YouTube presentation by the London Transport Museum Friends. The 1970s and 1980s were fairly turbulent times for London Transport. The period saw the tragedies of the Moorgate accident and the King's Cross fire. There was growing political influence on all that London Transport did and there were criticisms of its management style and competence. We can look back on those times now with a degree of distance and objectivity and to do that for us tonight, we have a presentation by Dr. James Fowler from the University of Essex. His talk is entitled London Transport Decline and Revival. Before I hand over to James, here's my usual reminder. If you're watching this talk during its premiere, you can post comments and questions for James using the chat function. If you're watching at a later date, then do please leave your comments and engage in the debate. James? Over to you. Hello and good evening everyone. My name is Dr James Fowler. I'm a lecturer at Essex University in Management and Strategy um, and my PhD was in um, the history of London's transport um, from 1905 to 1948. However this evening I'm going to talk about a slightly later period as the, um, the title suggests, a period really from the, the mid-1970s through to the late 1980s and the theme I'm going to talk about throughout this evening is decline and revival and how we conceptualize those things, why they happen and what implications there might be for TfL and its current place. Now the precise dates as I'm sure many of you who are watching this are aware of are from 1975 through to 1987 but I'm going to go slightly further back in time and the story that I'm going to tell really begins in 1970. So I'm using Moorgate and King's Cross essentially as symbols of decline because they were extremely public incidents that blazed across the public consciousness and highlighted what was going on within London transport on a day-to-day -day basis. And what seemed to be clear to people at that time was that the system was in a period of long-term decline. But the precise nature of that decline was quite heavily disputed and it's also a period of time in which London transport became quite political that is to say it became an object of political interference there were very serious political disputes both within the organization and outside the organization about what it should be doing and how it should be doing it and as a result the reputation I think of the post-war chairman particularly those from 1970 onwards has suffered quite considerably and I'm going to argue to you tonight somewhat unfairly in some ways. As I said earlier on I'll finish with a, a slide when I talk about what lessons there might be for today given the the crisis that essentially TfL is is currently facing in the wake of or even during this ongoing pandemic. So let's have a look then at the start with what has been written already about London transport in this period. And one of the issues I hope that this lecture this evening goes some way to dealing with is that actually there isn't an awful lot out there about this period of time. There's a lot of books and papers that have been written about the pre-war period up until 1948, but it gets a lot harder once you start to look at the, the post-war record. So the big seminal texts I'm sure many of us are very familiar with, Barker and Robbins, ends in 1970, doesn't really deal with this period at all. Crewman Jackson's original work ended in the mid-60s. There is a revised version uh, which takes us up to 1992, but what's interesting about it is that it is quite a technical account. So both those books are outstanding, but what they tend to talk about are what I would call technical developments within the system. So they talk about the expansion of the network, they talk a lot about rolling stock and so on, and if you're wanting a nice panoramic sequential view of how London transport has developed over a century. You can't do without them, they're superb. But one of the issues is that they don't really deal with the politics of the organization. And so when the organization becomes more political, as it does after 1970, I think some of their analysis doesn't entirely explain what's going on. You've also got Christian Walmart's recently revised Subterranean Railway, another excellent book. But what's interesting about it is that in 312 pages, about 30 of them deal with the post-war period. So again, it's very, very heavily skewed towards that, that earlier period of time before the Second World War. 
I think in the more specialised literature, you've then got Paul Garbutt's excellent book, London Transport and the Politicians, which in many ways focuses directly in on a lot of the things we're going to talk about. And his, in many ways, is an insider's perspective. So he, he offers a defence, really, I would argue, uh, of developments at London Transport in this period. And then from the outside, you have the critics, Leslie Chapman, about whom we're going to hear a lot more, and Horace Cutler. There critiques, I suppose, of London Transport and indeed other public institutions while they were senior civil servants and indeed a leader of the Greater London Council in the late 1970s. So what can we take away from all of that really? Well, again, if you read all those books and you surmise them, I think what you take away from it is this idea that the organisation is in decline. Um, and that's kind of just kind of accepted, really, by by all the um, uh, the individuals without picking that apart. And we're going to look at that in some more detail in just a moment and ask ourselves perhaps whether that is as universal or as fair a picture uh, as is commonly assumed um, to be the case. And secondly, that whatever your political convictions, um, politicians certainly began to take a much more direct role in the organisation of London Transport from about 1970 onwards, certainly from the mid-1970s. And I think that is commonly accepted, but I would like to look at the details of just what they were doing, how they were doing it, and what they were intending to achieve um, in a little bit more detail, perhaps, than um, uh, some of the existing um, uh, historical accounts offer us. So what we've got, I think, is an excellent foundation here. And what I'm intending to do is perhaps just push some of those boundaries a little bit further and improve our understanding of what happened in this period, and then extract from that and look at um, what we could learn or what we can take away um, uh, for the current situation we face in in 2021. So I'm going to divide decline down into a series of what I call stories, because I think it's very important to view decline in, in two ways. Firstly, you can look at decline as an objective phenomena. So are there more or less or fewer passengers traveling on London transport? Are, they, you know, are receipts up annually or are they down? But decline is also a story that people tell. Uh, and we'll come on to this later on when we look at this as a political phenomena. And the nature of the stories that are being told are very, very important politically. So the first story that I'm going to look at here is this idea about ridership. And if we look at the first graph over there on my left from 1970 to 82, superficially, it's quite an, an objective demonstration of decline. So millions of passengers per year kick off at about 2.2 million annually. And by 1982-83, we're right down uh, at 1.5 million. I think what's interesting is you just pick that apart in a little bit more detail. You can see that firstly, actually passenger numbers held fairly steady in the early part of the 1970s. It's not just a sort of story of inevitable sequential linear decline. It's more complex than that. And that secondly, overwhelmingly, that decline occurred on the road transport side. Rail passengers by tube and by cut and cover remained about the same over the whole period. Now, the second part of that, of course, is this story of revival which really isn't covered very well in the literature at all, I would suggest. And you can see there's a very pronounced nadir, if you will, of London Transport's operations in in 83. Graphs aren't usually this kind to statisticians, but this particular one is because there is little doubt that if you're wanting to look at a story of decline and revival, there you have it. And there's a very steep recovery from really 83 onwards into 87. And it's shared equally between the road and the rail side of the operations. Now, decline in ridership is really important, and I'm going to come back to emphasise this, because I would argue it's the primary lens through which people of a certain political persuasion view the purpose of transport. The purpose is to move people about. And if you take that as being the core reason to support the public transport system, then ridership is the area that you are going to focus on. And what you can see there is a very clear story that you can use for political ends should you wish to do so. But let's look at the other stories of decline, because there's a lot more to this than just the passengers. The next one, which is really, really pivotal to the politics in this era, are the finances. And again, you can see quite a clear story being told here. You can see that in the early years of the 1970s, London Transport was operationally solvent in that it it basically met its costs out of its revenue. It wouldn't have been able to invest in long-term infrastructure, but for a brief period of time, it could meet its day-to-day activities. That's then followed by a really dramatic 
decline, you could argue, from a certain political perspective. Because what you can see is that receipts drop off a little bit, so suggesting that the real cost of fares perhaps is falling at this point, or that passenger numbers are falling potentially. But at the same time, costs have really accelerated considerably. And you get to the mid-1970s, and you have an annual subsidy being paid in of almost £400 million, where as a matter of sort of two, three years prior to that, there was no public money being uh, dispensed on an annual basis whatsoever. And that, of course, is political dynamite in a lot of ways, because you have two conflicting views, and we'll come and explore these later in the presentation. There are the people who say, look, the first duty of a public organisation is to be solvent. And a lot of the chairmen of London Transport in the earlier period, in the 50s and 60s, very firmly believe that. But there's also a growing political conviction in the early 1970s that actually it's perfectly normal for a large public transport system to enjoy a subsidy. And that what we're seeing there on that graph isn't a disaster at all. It's just normality. It's what the New York transportation system has, the Berlin transportation system, the Parisian transportation system. But I think we have to view this in the context of the time. And people were highly alarmed, not least ratepayers, because, of course, in the end, somebody had to pick up this enormous bill. So let's look at how this develops then into the late 80s. Now, it's not quite such a dramatic graph here. It's not as easy to extrapolate uh, the lessons from all of this. But I think what you can see is that from, again, the mid 80s, subsidy falls from 400 to 200 million pounds a year. It halves, which is, I think, quite a dramatic achievement, however you, you choose to look at it. You might also notice that from the early 80s, costs essentially plateau at about 1 billion you can see there the yellow line across the top there. And that as a consequence, receipts rising modestly are sufficient to drive subsidy right down. Now, this, of course, leads to a lot of political division. Some people say this is excellent news. All right? Our idea has always been that this organization should, as far as reasonably possible, stand on its own two feet and not present a burden to the capital's ratepayers. Other people argue that this results in systematic underinvestment and as a consequence, disasters of the type we saw at Moorgate and King's Cross are more likely because the system simply isn't being invested in. But either way, I think what's important to extrapolate out of this is to see how politically a lot of capital can be made out of this. These are stories being told about decline. It's also, I think, interesting to note that while people talk about a constant decline, it's not actually true. Decline goes through different phases. And I think you can see that very clearly here in this particular graphic where subsidy shoots up very rapidly up until about the point that Horace Cutler wins the elections for the Conservatives and the GLC in 1977. There's then another peak in the early 80s, and then it falls away again towards the late 80s. And all those correspond quite neatly and, and probably unsurprisingly to different eras of political control at the GLC and indeed, uh, indeed nationally. So let's look at a couple of other perhaps lesser known but I think equally important stories about decline here that are going on in the background. And this graph here really shows what I would loosely call productivity at London Transport over the period. You can see the number of passengers that travel annually and break that down by the number of employees you've got in the system. You can see the number of receipts that are being taken and again how that's broken down per number of employees in the system. And I think the important thing to see here is that again after the, the early 80s and certainly the mid 80s there's a very very rapid uh, fall off in the number of people employed. And as a result of that, because receipts rise slightly and because passenger numbers across the system rise in that period, productivity shoots up. And the whole organisation is vastly more productive by 87 than it was even just three, four years um, prior to that point. And I think that's something that's not often drawn attention to for a variety of reasons. But you could argue that the, the underpinning health of the organisation, its sort of long-term prospects are demonstrated in that graph, a long period of slow decline, you know, or stasis, stagnation perhaps, followed by quite a rapid turnaround after about 1983. The last graph then, or the last story of, of decline that I'm going to tell is what you can see here. And I would argue this is a story about status, the status of the organisation, how it's viewed nationally, perhaps by the public, but perhaps more importantly, how it's viewed within the mechanisms of government in Whitehall. In other words, when we're paying someone to run this major organization in the capital city, what do we actually think they're worth? And what you can see really is that after 73, there is a, a collapse 
in the real value of the chairman's salary. Now, again, different political strands here. Some people would say, quite rightly too, we don't pay fat cats a lot of money to run uh, public organisations. We shouldn't do that. On the other hand, it does, I think, cause something of a crisis of confidence, a crisis of recruitment, perhaps at the highest levels, where the reality is that the value that's being attached to that job is in free fall. And as you can see there, it halves in value uh, over the space of about four or five years there. And I think it's inevitable that the morale, perhaps, of an organization, that the quality of the sort of people it might be attracting to the top jobs is going to suffer under those conditions. That then changes. I think what's interesting is that it changes a little bit earlier than that kind of inflection point we noted earlier uh, in 1982-83. And there's a steady recovery in status uh, and prestige, you could argue, attaching to the chairman's position from about 1979, 1980 onwards. It's interesting, that predates the turnaround in in outputs, the turnaround in passengers, uh, and the turnaround in in finance. So not everything's entirely coincidental, but there is a story here, I think, especially if you blend all those graphs together and you look at the period as a whole. So four stories of decline then, each um, different in their own way, telling slightly different stories perhaps, but I think you can definitely look at an overall trend. Let's look at um, what this perhaps tells us in summary then before we move on. Um, So first of all, I think, as I've said a moment ago, there really is a moment where London Transport makes a turnaround after a prolonged period of of decline in around about the early 80s. And that backs up um, what we know from the existing literature. But it doesn't always look at how those things happened in the kind of detail we've seen there, or perhaps extrapolate the political aspects of all those aspects of decline that we've just been talking about. What I'm now going to do is I'm now going to sort of dive in and look at the politics and to a certain extent the personalities um, to explain what happened. And as I've said before, we'll look at anything we can draw out of that and how it relates to, to TfL's current dilemmas. So To analyse the politics then, what I'm going to argue to you is there are basically two choices in how you go about strategising your transport policy. You can either run your system as a utility maximising organisation, and I think the easiest way of explaining this is what you can see up there on the, the screen at the moment. You focus on conveying the largest number of people possible, so it's all about ridership. Everything else exists, but it's of lesser importance. And I think if you take the utility maximizing perspective to its logical conclusion, you get to that universal provision free at point of access perspective. And as we know, there are a number of transport systems across the world that have experimented with either nugatory fares or or even no fares at all for certain uh, citizens living in that city. So that's where utility maximization ultimately takes you. And the people who are keen on that will be looking at the first graph that I showed you. It's all about the ridership. Okay, The finance is less important. Um, It's more about who you're carrying and, and how many of them are you carrying on a daily basis. The alternative perspective is what you see there. It's called profit maximizing. Now, I think That's a bit of a a misnomer in the context of a public transport system. I don't think anybody now seriously expects large public utilities like a transport system to make a profit. They did, obviously, in the earlier part of the the 20th century. But I think a better way of characterizing that is perhaps to call it a a cost-minimizing perspective. And the idea here is that to some degree, your services need to meet demand. They need to at least cover their costs. And the idea, I suppose, underpinning that is that each journey taken on that system represents a specific benefit for that individual. So you get on the bus, you pay to cover the costs of running that bus, you know, keeping it fueled up, proportion of the driver's wages, and the value to you of traveling three or four miles on it. And then you get off again. It's just a singular event. Whereas the utility maximizing perspective says is there are wider social benefits to having a frequent bus service, such as the absence of congestion, such as perhaps a you know, reduction in road accidents, a cleaner environment, and so on and so forth. And you're never going to capture all those benefits through the fare box. One individual couldn't possibly pay to cover all of that. It would be unreasonably expensive. So you just have to support the provision of bus services or, or train services out of general taxation and the community in general benefit from frequent, fast, clean buses that people want to use. Now, I think the important thing is to realise that those two perspectives are technical discussions about service patterns, patterns of investment, fares, you know, rolling stock quality and so on, but they are also political philosophies. So there's a very close linkage between a free market perspective and the the profit maximising 
framework of analysis there are more socialized visions of transport and its uses that equate effectively to the uh, the utility maximizing perspective of provision so how does this all relate to events how does this play into decline what does this have to do with decline and revival why does it make decline and revival important uh, and it, it makes it important because it, essentially it's what links a political story to to the transport story all right so this is these are the stories that politicians are trying to tell uh, the public about their transport system and whether it's failing or whether it's succeeding or, or what they can reasonably look forward to in terms of the, the services they enjoy so to understand this period in time, I think we have to delve just for a little bit into, into London's politics and look at what's going on. So the first thing is that between 1933 and 1968, London is completely Labour dominated. Labour wins every London County Council um, uh, election in that period. In 1965, the London County Council was replaced by the Greater London Council, but that doesn't seem to matter too much because Labour wins that following election in 65 as well. And I think while it's Labour dominated, what's quite interesting is that actually at the top, there's quite a lot of consensus between the people who, who run the GLC at the top. So you can see Bill Fisk there, uh, the last Labour leader before 1968 of the, uh, the new GLC. And there's his replacement, Desmond Plummer, over on the right of him just there. Now, actually, although they were divided, one was Labour and one Conservative, they actually had a fairly consensual way of viewing what public services were really all about. But this begins to change. So the traditional left, as represented by Bill Fisk there, is defeated in a landslide in 1968, and Desmond Plummer comes in. Actually, that doesn't make an enormous amount of difference to what's expected in that period. What's important is that in the background, the Labour Party changes, and they win again in 1973, only five years later. But by then, it's quite a different sort of party. There's the new left have come in. And one of the things that, interestingly, both the new left and the new right, and we're going to talk about them in just a moment, agree on, is that large public corporations like London Transport don't actually provide a very good service for the citizens of London. But there's a key difference in how the new left and the new right see things. So the new left are very keen on enfranchising more people, in, in a sense, or allowing them to play a bigger role in society as citizens. Transport's part of that. So they're very keen on widening transport provision, reducing fares, encouraging more people to use the system than before, and to kind of bring that those ideas forward. They've got to try, it's important to them to try and paint, I think, a perspective or a, a, yeah, an understanding of a system that had hitherto been in decline. And what needed to happen would be a, a drastic reduction in fares, an increase in the number of services um, uh, available to allow people within London to live fuller lives as citizens, to be able to travel more freely. So they win the election uh, and almost immediately they freeze fares at a time of high inflation, so considerable reduction in real fares for most people and there are quite large pay increases across the board and an increase in the number of staff employed by London Transport at around that time or classic utility maximizing policies. So as we saw earlier what that leads to is a, a huge spike in the level of subsidy and that frightens a lot of people because rates essentially go up. It's also quite a worrying idea I think for a lot of people that the organization isn't really making ends meet at this time. And that concerns people. It's sufficient to bring Horace Cutler back in, in the 78 election. Now you can see him below talking with his Thatcher. And his brief really is to arrest the dramatic rise in subsidy, the dramatic rise in costs at London Transport at the time. And he does so. He is, as you can see from those graphs earlier on, successful in both those things. He manages to achieve that. So we've seen a pivot, really, I think, between people who will be looking at the graph you saw earlier about ridership and saying, look, ridership is what we are all about. And then it goes over in 78 to the people who say, look, we need to look at finance here. We need to look at productivity, what's going on within the organization. And we need to make drastic change in that direction. But politics is a bit of a seesaw at the time. The new left win it back in 1981. We move on to things like fares fair. It's really the classic policy of the new left in relation to transport at that time. And then the new right react to that essentially by just abolishing. Um, well, first taking London, the London Transport Executive away from the GLC and then abolishing it in 86. So we have this sort of very dramatic period that's quite well documented in reality. None of those things are, are obscure. But I think the important thing is to kind of dive underneath that and ask ourselves what's going on, what are the principles that are clashing against one another at this time. 
So what you have, I argue, is a, a move from a situation where London transport is traditionally fairly quasi-autonomous. In other words, politicians want to give it to someone responsible and then leave it alone. That would be the best thing. That's what they're looking for. And that governs things really all the way through from the 30s, all the way through to the, the late 60s. Now, there then arise another new set of politicians on both the, the new left and the new right who are no longer satisfied with that situation. They're not happy to hand London Transport over to the great and the good anymore. They want to get involved directly in a variety of different ways. So decline, I argue, is actually a very important political story full stop because it creates the justification for coming in and starting to intervene after 1970. Whether it's perceived or whether it's real, it doesn't matter. It's the justification to say we no longer trust a certain strata of managers and, and chairmen to get on with this anymore. We need to get involved. And what you can see from 70 onwards, particularly after 74, the chairman becomes a political appointment uh, and day-to-day -day operations are, are interfered with politicians. Finally, even judges uh, get involved in setting fair levels in the early 80s. And it's a remarkable, it's traumatic, um, and I think it's a, it's a contravention, really, of this old consensus, really, that you just leave experts to get on with running London transport. What's at stake here? Well, I think it's kind of two visualizations. I talked earlier on about you know, utility maximization as one way of running um, your transportation system and about profit or maximization or cost minimization. I think another way of looking at it is to say, how do you view passengers? Are passengers citizens? Uh, of this polity, you know, London? Do we want to enhance their rights as citizens? Do we want to offer everybody greater mobility within our city, irrespective of their socioeconomic background or, or any other background? So are we going to reduce fares, make facilities friendlier to the disabled and expand utility uh, and mobility in that way? Or do we see passengers as consumers? Consumers need choice. You have to sort of sit at the heart of everything. They want good standards when they get on board a bus. They want trains and so on that run on time. They want to feel safe. And in many ways, you could argue that actually citizens and consumers have quite a lot in common in certain ways. Expanding consumer rights probably expands citizens' rights at the same time. And certainly it's very different from this picture of a sort of rather self-satisfied uh, and complacent organisation that regards you know, passengers as something of an irritation that both the new left and the new right paint of London transport in this period. So eventually, as we can see, their LT is removed from municipal politics and the consumers win, or rather a vision of London transport as reactive to passengers as consumers wins this battle after 1984. The question we have to ask ourselves, I think, is were the politicians right to intervene? And here I have a quote from Sir Kenneth Robinson, who was chairman for about four years between 1975 and 78, about how he views the organisation. It's lifted from his opening interview in the London Transport Staff magazine. I'm just going to read it out. Obviously, any traveller in London must have thoughts and ideas, maybe half-baked, about how he thinks the service can be improved. But I know that all possible developments, changes um, and improvements have already been considered. And if they've not already been adopted, then there is probably a very good reason why not. Comments like this kind of epitomise the perspective of both the new right and the new left, that London transport is complacent. Yes, there are passengers, but their views about things might be half-baked and they suggest how things might be different. I also, in the times in which we live, I notice that he talks about how he thinks the service can be improved. I think that's quite telling in a lot of ways, speaks a lot about the, uh, the time. So there's perhaps an expectation that the majority of people who use it are working men ultimately, in the background. And again, that is beginning to change in this period as well. And certainly the new left feel the system needs to be opened up to people from minorities, people who are disabled, and um, that women should feel safer when they are travelling on public transport in this particular period. So that's the charge, I suppose. Um, and I think it's quite nicely encapsulated um, uh, by that statement there from, um, uh, from Sir Kenneth Robinson. Um, there then follows, um, about two years later, a really quite extraordinary episode um, involving a, a former civil servant called Leslie Chapman. And I think it's fascinating um, because Horace Cutler brings him in essentially as a kind of watchdog on the board to, to shake up um, what Cutler believes is managerial complacency on the board. And Chapman writes a series of letters straight reports to his colleagues after about six months in post, telling them what he thinks about the state of London transport at that time. Now, I think they are, in their own way, I would argue, some of the most remarkable documents in the historical archive, because 
they're expressed in this sort of extraordinarily abrasive and, and really rather juvenile way, as you can see there. In a sense, it's a shame because Chapman, I think, is on to something. The difficulty is that he behaves in a way that makes it impossible to take him seriously, or at the very least, makes it very easy to sideline him in lots of ways. So here's a letter written a couple of days after Chapman's letter was presented or his report was presented to the board. It's from Rafe Bennett and he's writing to Gordon Taylor, who's the chairman of the transport committee at the GLC. And you can see there that the paper itself says Bennett turned out to be third form stuff full of half truths and inaccuracies. And I can tell you that having read it, he's absolutely right. It is quite extraordinary, really. Chapman's credibility suffers quite badly. But there's something else that Bennett spots, and he's absolutely right here as well, I would suggest. The report may well have been written for a wider audience, and indeed that is so, because eventually Bennett leaks the contents, essentially, of his report come letter. And because he's gone around and focused on what you might call particularly photogenic or, or lurid elements of London transport lifestyle in, in headquarters at that time, focus on champagne, chauffeurs and so on. The press kind of light on this with glee. Now, I think it's controversial and always will be, and quite rightly so in a way, because in reality, what London transport needed at this time was a, a sort of thorough and professional review of how it was doing business. But instead, it, it gets Leslie Chapman, who flags up as I've said, chauffeurs and champagne. And that inevitably excites a lot of media interest and brings the controversy and the, the, the ultimate conflict between the chairman of London Transport and the chairman of the GLC to the, you know, the, the front page of the newspapers. But it does it in a kind of really unhelpful way because at the end of the day, the problems, if they exist, are not going to be put right by cancelling the alcohol account or getting rid of the cars. It's a much deeper and more systemic issue perhaps that, that the system is facing. So happily at this period, PA International were commissioned at that time in 1978 and they report back two years later and they have a number of things to say at about the same time as Leslie Chapman's letters are beginning to get into the public eye. And this is a much more credible document in a lot of ways. Two years spent on it, professional observations um, uh, rather than sort of rather juvenile and aggressive turn of phrase. And what they say essentially vindicates, you could argue, the, the new rights critique but of London transport in this period. So the idea, as you see there, the encouragement of bureaucratic function, the diminution of the need for change. And I think that bottom piece there, you can see obscuring the appreciation that a historically captive market has become steadily less so. Now, all that's expressed shall we say, as a kind of in a critique that assumes that passengers are consumers. But what I find so interesting is that actually a lot of these criticisms are equally true if you view passengers as citizens as well, because it's about paying attention to the needs of passengers and thinking more about how a better service that's more closely tailored to their requirements can be achieved. And actually, whether you view passengers as citizens or as consumers, both those things are true. So there we go. Another comment that the power or the prestige of the chairman has been undermined quite considerably. And we saw perhaps that backs up what was seen earlier in terms of the level of the chairman's salary over different years. So people don't aspire to be the chairman anymore. That's seen as a rather transitory and quite dangerous post in some ways. Politicians firing you every time there's a new election or a different GLC elected. And finally, the famous conclusion, and this was the bit that made it into the newspapers, the executive board is weak in skills. And this was damning, really. And you can see their criticisms underneath. In fact, there's a much more detailed conclusion, which you can read, where they have 12 points, in fact, where they think the board is not living up to um, uh, the standards that you might reasonably expect of it. So I would argue that the, the charge or the, the suggestion that politicians were right to intervene is probably correct. Um, especially on the basis of the PAA international report. The question then is, do politicians intervene on the basis of making sure that passengers of citizens' rights um, um, are enforced or, or, or propagated, or do they intervene to reconceptualize um, passengers as consumers? So let's look at what happens next. So Rafe Bennett is fired in 1980 and replaced by Sir Peter Macefield, who you can see up there on the top right. And I think that this is the point really at the, at the highest echelons within London transport where there is this pivot to profit maximisation. So 
The GLC toys with the idea of utility maximization, but really from here on in, there's a fairly clear course that's cut. First by Sir Peter Maysfield, who does a lot of foundational work over about two years, and then that is carried on by Sir Keith Bright after 1982. But as you can see there, you can see what's being weighed up. The agreed corporate posture should be to group the profitable services and then group together the more unprofitable ones. And you can see that they are beginning to review the organization and split it down into its utility and profit maximizing elements from about this period. Now, what I think is interesting in terms of the stories that politicians like to tell is that this pivot, as you can see, if we think back to our graphs earlier on in this presentation, occurs at about the same time that there is this major revival in the organization. Passenger numbers go up, finances look a bit better, um, productivity goes up, uh, and even the chairman's salary goes up as well. So as a political story for people on the new right, this is great because they've implemented their reforms. And look, now London Transport is performing better than it ever has done before, more productive than it ever has been, more passengers, and so on and so forth. The question we have to ask ourselves really is, is this unquestionable revival a matter of causality, i.e. is this because profit maximizing policies have been implemented? And again, I think we can see the 1985 report just there as being um, a classic example of implementing those type of strategies you know, to operate and procure services with safety, efficiency, and economy to match demand. That is the essence of a, a profit maximizing approach to all of this. Or is this actually part of a wider story where yes, London transport is improving, but so is London. So demographic decline, which have been occurring ever since the, the Second World War is arrested in the 80s and turned around in 1986, there's the big bang. London has become much more prosperous. There's a sort of the financial community revives and that spills over, unemployment falls. So you could argue that even if London Transport had done nothing at all, they probably would have shown some kind of uptick in their performance just by virtue of the greater prosperity of the capital all around them. I think there's a couple of images I'm just going to share with you now just to show how things change over this period. So it's that linkage, I think, between this turnaround in prestige, in authority, which you can see there. And that picture, by the way, of the, the board from 1991 occupies the entirety of page two uh, of that report. And I think what you can see there is a kind of a renewed confidence in themselves. They think they've got this right. And all the statistics and all the metrics that they're being judged on are all pointing in the right direction. Like I said, though, I think the question we have to ask ourselves is whether that is because of the policies those people implemented and what we're implementing at that time, or is that just part of that big picture that I've, I'm showing you on the left-hand side, where essentially the City of London powers the capital, reverses demographic decline, dramatic increase in salaries across the board, and consequently lower unemployment uh, and much greater footfall on the system as well. So I don't have an answer for that, but I think it's important to ask that question because there is a political story here which the new right will be very pleased with. And so we implement our profit maximizing policies and guess what? London transport improves dramatically. Question, is it that simple? I leave it for you to decide. Right then, I think that brings me to my conclusions. The question then is, how does, how does TfL react, react to decline? How does it react to this sort of sledgehammer uh, that's hit it in the past 10 months or so? I think there are some parallels not direct ones, but ones worth exploring. The first is that there's this kind of cultural legacy. There's 20 glorious years of TfL between 2000 and 2020, where I think if you dig into what's going on and you look at the annual reports and the policies, we have seen an organization broadly dedicated to utility maximization in that time, not exclusively. That's going to be difficult, I think, as harder times bite, much like the people in the 70s who had you know, the glorious years of the pick Ashfield consensus behind them and London Transport always getting bigger and better and more centralised. You then have to deal with how you manage an organisation where every year isn't bigger and better than the one that went before it. And I think that's one of those things that, that's in, in prospect, I suspect, for Transport for London. And it's hard, as the chairman of the time would have attested to. The second thing I think that drops out of that, and I hope has been evident throughout this entire presentation, is that almost irrespective of the objective facts of what's going on within the organization, the ridership, the finances, the productivity, it's actually political narratives that set the parameter for what is deemed successful or what is not. So I think one of the questions going forward is, what are the metrics here? Is London Transport or TfL going to remain 
quite strongly wedded, I think, to the, the ridership and the wider social benefits that it provides to London as a city? Or is it going to have to think a lot more about minimizing its costs? And the, the only answer to that will lie, in, will lie in politics. And what it shows, I think, is you can run an organization very well. And you know, all the chairmen, I think, of the post-war period are, are unfairly maligned in a way because they were good managers uh, and they were honest and they were effective. But what was going on for them was that they weren't producing the things that politics wanted them to do. They were out of alignment with the wider political consensus. So I think that's something that TfL needs to be quite mindful of. Where, which way are we going from here? Is it are we going to continue with utility maximization or is there going to be a, a retreat in terms of service provision and a focus on, uh, on making sure that subsidy is minimized? And the final thing, I think, is that the customer is always right. That was a problem, I think, that London Transport had right up until probably the mid-80s to one degree or another. The question then is, is it the customer or, or is it the citizen? And again, that, that's a question for, in a sense, for politicians to decide. But I think TfL can probably shape that conversation in the direction that it wants. Does it regard its passengers as customers? And that fits or dovetails much more easily with a policy of cost minimization, if that's the way it wants to go. Or does it want to construe its passenger base as citizens and expand their rights um, uh, and, and wider access to transport in that way? I'd just like to acknowledge both the Transport for London Corporate Archive and the, the London Transport Museum Library. They've been enormously helpful, Tamara Thornhill and Melissa McGreach, and to my studies and to my research for presentations like these, hugely supportive. And um, I really wouldn't have been able to do things like this presentation and others without their assistance. Likewise, I'd like to offer a lot of thanks to Caroline Warhurst at the London Transport Museum Library for all her assistance over the years as well. It's hugely appreciated, and I'd like to say a big thank you. I'm going to end in just a moment, and I want to say two things, though. First of all, you can get in touch with me at any time you want if you're interested in any of this. Uh, you can see my email address there, um, also on LinkedIn. Um, and there's a couple of books I have out on the, uh, on the topic if people are interested in those as well. Thank you all very much indeed uh, for listening in to this um, uh, this evening. It's been an enormous pleasure um, to present, and I'm very grateful for being given the opportunity to do so. So thank you all very much indeed to the, uh, the London Transport Museum friends, uh, and I hope that when times are happier to uh, be able to meet up with a number of you in, um, uh, in due course. Thank you very much again. Thank you, James, for that very perceptive and well-argued presentation. Our series of recorded talks has served us very well during the pandemic, but now more than ever, it will be great to open up the meeting to discussion and debate. In the present circumstances, I'm afraid that discussion will have to take place online, so do please engage. Before we sign off, can I say to anyone watching who is not already a friend, please do think about joining us. It's a great way of supporting the museum and of securing membership benefits for yourself. Full details are on the Friends website. And a special shout out this time to those who are already friends. Thank you for your continuing support. It really is appreciated. Thanks again to James for an excellent talk. Thanks to everyone for watching. Join us again soon for another of our at home presentations.